realize that that would be my fate as well. I was terrified. It's like you're drowning and there's nothing to grasp hold of. No one there to throw you a life free. Constant sense of desperation. Anticipation. Still somehow believing that we're good people and that someone is going to come to the rescue. That surely somebody's going to stand up for what's right and just and put a stop to that madness. She can only takes so many blows. And after a while, I realized there was going to be no rescue. That I was going to die there as well. And I didn't realize what they were doing until they'd already shoved me in there real quick. They put me in the cage that the man who had been injured had been in. Before they took him to medical, they'd put him back into his cage for a little while. And as soon as they shoved me through, I knew what kind of life I was about to have to live. Because there was blood everywhere. They didn't even take the time to clean the cell up before they put me in there. I don't know how somebody could bleed that much and survive it. The man was in a rage. and running around the cell, and he spread blood everywhere. It was on the walls, on the floor, it was on the bunk. And they left me there like that. And that's what made it very real for me that the things that I had heard about prison were true. It was cold and violent. There was no compassion, no... no humanity. This was normal, everyday business for them. Men being violently attacked and stabbed to death. When they shoved me into that first cell, and I saw all the blood everywhere, and I panicked, I froze, I didn't know what to do. And they asked me to come back towards the door so they could unhandcuff me, and I refused. I'm not staying in here, I was freaking out. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if I was freezing or something. I was shaking so hard. Like my body trying to find warmth or something. I wonder what the hell I'd got myself into. A typical middle class American life. My father was in the military. Uh, so I traveled around when I was young, living on military bases made much of what happened later all the worse, especially when I was a teenager because I had every chance when I was a kid to excel, to do something with my life, to be somebody, to go to a good school. Uh, I didn't have to live the life that my parents had to live when they were young, you know, lives of terrible poverty and of want and, and need. When I was a teenager, uh, I discovered that I had a highly addictive personality, and then when I started taking drugs, it was it was a yes or no proposition. Um, there was no middle ground, there was no moderation, and I jumped in with both feet. And within a few years, I wasn't in school anymore. 
I was alienated from my family. And every time that I found myself sitting in the back seat of a police car wearing handcuffs for something stupid, I always swore that I would reform, that I would change my behavior and stop embarrassing my family and myself. But I was never able to overcome the addiction and the self-destructive behavior in it. Uh, most of my friends were, they behaved the same way. Um, all we thought about was partying and going to bars and being inebriated all the time. There was um, quite a few people in that group, even more in the peripheral group. Um, one of those people was a young woman named Pam Willis. She was, uh, she grew up in the same neighborhood as my girlfriend at the time. And she was a good person. She was uh, friendly, always positive. Everybody liked her. Pam was staying with another friend of uh, my girlfriend's who also, was also from that same neighborhood. And they all knew each other. They had grown up together. And on December 10th of 1982, a man broke into her house, raped her and killed her. Everyone that knew her couldn't believe that such a thing had happened. You hear about homicide, you read about it in the papers or hear it on the news. But it's something that doesn't affect us. It happens to other people. I had already so badly damaged my reputation that I had no hope of surviving what the state was about to do to me. And instead of being invited to the police station, they came and they took me by force. And after three days of physical and psychological abuse, the state's representative who saw that abuse. Looked me right in the eyes and said, Curtis, I think you're a liar. And if you don't tell us who killed Pam right now, you'll take his place in court. And I didn't know, and he kept his word. And soon thereafter, I was charged with capital murder. After I'd been in jail for a while, and had a chance to assess the situation, I was surprised that I 
I found myself hopeful. I believed that I was going to be okay. We learned that in school here in America. It's, it's, we talk about it a lot here. and It's reinforced in school that we're a nation of laws, that we have a constitution that uh, protects the citizens, a bill of rights that guarantees each and every one of us these inalienable rights that are always spoken of here. The right to a fair trial, the right to counsel, the absolute right to due process of law. And because I'd heard these things spoken of my entire life, even if I didn't understand the foundation on which those laws were written, or how they were applied in the courtroom. I had faith in them, that that is who we are as a people. And I really did believe that I was going to be okay. That I would have a competent attorney who would conduct a good investigation on my behalf and who would diligently advocate for me. That he would successfully challenge the state. Prisons are very popular in the U.S. But to be sitting in that car wearing shackles and handcuffs and having that car slowly pull through that gate, guards everywhere with weapons, to know that I'm a nonviolent person, a simple person. I didn't, I've done nothing to leave no mark in society, to have all of that attention on me. It seems surreal, why do they care so much about me? I was of no consequence. And I still didn't fully understand how serious the matter was. And I'll always remember the sound of that huge metal gate when it closed behind me. I remember them all from that day as we went through the layers of security and hearing those gates close and knowing that I would never walk past them again. The worst memory, the worst vision, worst thing that I saw. Two mothers sitting in the audience crying, one with hope, one without. The men being led away in handcuffs, taken to be executed. The worst thing that I saw were the photographs of Pam. The prosecutor at the time was a guy named Robert Macy. He said several times on the record that executing innocent people is okay in order to preserve the death penalty for those that deserve it. In a penitentiary, they call men like him kill freaks. That's all they talk about is killing people. That's all they try to do is kill people. And in conducting these dirty trials that he ran, every little type of psychological 
warfare, every type of evidentiary shenanigan was pulled by this man. And one of them included taking autopsy photos and crime scene photos and tossing them at the defendant so that they land right in front of him. And he did that to me as well. And I couldn't help but look. I heard how she died. And there it was. In color, eight by 10. Of Pam. Friend and daughter, neighbor, niece a human being lying naked in the kitchen floor with a knife sticking out of her chest, dead. This wasn't a show on television. It wasn't a crime book. This was reality TV as real as it gets. The man who killed her got away with it. He will never be identified and he will never be held accountable for what he did. That is the worst thing that happened to me. That is the worst thing that I saw, that I ever felt, was when that photograph landed in front of me and I saw her laying there like that, stripped of pride and dignity and her life. And I will never be okay, nor forgive the men and women that did that to her, who betrayed her in such a despicable manner. The only people that came and spoke for me were my mother and my father. and have to sit there at that table and see them both take the stand in my name and beg them to spare my life. That was one of the worst things about everything that happened to me. was those moments when they took the stand and I realized how much I meant to them. And I had taken it for granted. That I really didn't understand anything after all those years of good examples right in front of me. What love really means, what family means to thinking and caring people. And 10 days later, I had to stand in a court of law in the United States of America in front of my family, in front of Pam's family, the media, everyone who had gathered that day, and listen as the judge berated me for being a coward, for not taking responsibility for Pam's death. And he told the people assembled there that day that it made him proud to sentence someone like me to death and did so. I thought at that time that I had good strength of will, that I had the type of character, the willpower to withstand such a blow. And you never know how strong you are until the test comes and there was mine. And like most
most of the men I met on death row, I failed that test. It was too much. That weight was too heavy and it dragged me under. I lost faith in everything that I ever believed in. I knew that I wasn't going to survive it. When I was finally transferred to death row, it only got worse. When I saw the conditions there, and the men that I met, to be struck such a blow, to carry such a weight, I sank straight to the bottom. You go to death row and you watch men lose their minds, see them lose their lives. And you say, I've sunk to the bottom. I'm drowning. Family members start to die off and you say, I've sunk to the bottom. Each time I'm convinced you, it can't get any worse than this. This is the bottom. I feel nothing. My, my life's gone. I have no hope. And it keeps piling up on you. And you find yourself saying again, I've sunk to the bottom. I've drowned. I've lost my life. I can't take any more. And you do. It never ends. You run out of... You run out of air. And then one day you find out just how bad it can get. But I was convicted of murder right then and there as soon as those words came out of her mouth. And I knew that nothing that I said or did was going to change that fact. So I didn't have that same surprise that other men get when they hear those words, guilty. I already knew they were going to do it. I could hear my mom sitting behind me cry. I've heard other men and women talk about what it was like, that sense of dread and doom that they feel, that I felt too, when they hear the words guilty. In those first years there, the, the thing that motivated me the most, besides my own freedom, establishing my own innocence, was making sure that the right man got caught for what he did. The fuck? It seemed like a no-brainer at the time. We knew, everybody knew it. We didn't know what, but we knew that whoever killed our friend had left behind a bunch of evidence, clear evidence that would identify him. But all records indicate that they didn't do that. They abandoned her and her family. And let a rapist and murderer walk away free. And the more I thought about that, the matter I got.
and in later years as I began to break down mentally, it was hatred that kept me alive. Revenge. Begging and praying that someday they would open that door just for a minute to get at the people who did that to me. Pure, unadulterated revenge. I will get you for this, I promise you. I swear it on my life. You'll pay for what you've done. And it is a profoundly unhealthy way to live, to think every day. The only thing that motivates you is violence. Revenge. To see other people suffer. It's not who I was. It's not who I am now. I don't understand how I came to be that person. I can say what it was, but I don't have that deep, profound understanding of it of where that switch is. That when flipped, we don't notice, we don't care. And we lock onto those people. I saw it later happen to other men as well. Pure hatred. Walking around raging all the time. And you become a very unpleasant person to be around. Get the fuck away from me. I mean it. Fuck off. Don't come anywhere near me. Armed all the time. Wearing body armor all the time. Just waiting, daring somebody to say anything. When I first saw guys like that, I thought they were just crazy and violent. Probably deserved to be where they where they were. That's probably who they were on the outside, and it wasn't, I found out. Because I became one of them. We're told at the very least in this country about the death penalty that it's only reserved for the worst of the worst men who have committed crimes so terrible that they forfeited their right to life. And that's the first thing that I discovered that that's not true at all. There were men there who suffered such debilitating mental illness that they didn't even know where they were. There was a marked racial disparity and economic disparity. I knew then that I was really in trouble that I might not survive this. That I was just this one little voice with no one but my mom and dad to help me. Up against the power of the entire government. So I became resigned to my fate. And forgot about what it meant to be a free person. To walk in the grass at your bare feet. To watch a moon rise. Just to be a normal human being. Every time they executed one of my friends, it got worse. I stopped caring about myself or my family. And I stopped making new friends. Because it was unhealthy. Because every new face that came in, I knew. As soon as I saw him. Come onto the unit or come onto the yard. You seem okay, but I don't want to be your friend. I just have to watch you die too. I became close friends with 24, maybe 25 people. 
close friends. And out of that 24 or so men, two of them survived. They killed the rest of them. And every time they did it, I didn't think that my situation would get any worse, that my mental state couldn't possibly get any worse, that I'd already carried the heaviest load that I could take, that they had already sent me to the bottom. one day that your time's up. It's over. Grow up. Take it like a man. Fill out your last will and testament. Write your last letters and get it over with. Walk right over there to the edge and get ready to jump. And I settled in and did nothing to save myself. And just awaited my own fate. I never thought about the death penalty much or criminal justice matters. When I was young, I was irresponsible and selfish. But I heard a lot about it, especially as I was coming of age after Dad retired from the Navy and we moved to Oklahoma. It's a very hot topic here, it's very popular punishment. It was endorsed by the government, so I assumed that it must be okay, that there was no question about its effectiveness, its morality. And because we profess to be a Christian nation, I assumed that those men on death row were treated well. They were treated humanely. Until I got to death row, I never had to really confront my own mortality. In January of 2001, the state of Oklahoma deliberately tried to set a national record by executing more men in one month than any other state had ever done. I watched them all grow up, and the ones who had committed homicide in one way or another saw them suffer over the years for what they had done, knowing that there was no way they could atone for what they did. No apologies. Nothing. And I've always wondered about how I felt then that, that I was able to build walls that high, that thick. despite knowing what was happening, that they were taking grown men and strapping them to a table, putting a needle in their arm and pumping them full of poison until they were dead. I was able to defend myself against that, that vision, that idea that I was going to die there too. And I have no idea how I did it. No, I just did. And I ignored it. And as the years passed, they began to pick off my friends. And each time they did it, I was sure that I wasn't going to be able to live another day. Over the years, I've watched that process unfold in other men confident that they were going to be okay. Then watch the terror set in as they know that it's not going to be okay. 
and finally resignation. The entire process, the confinement, the treatment is deliberately cruel. So that when they finally arrive at your door and say, let's go, you go willingly just so you can end that fucking nightmare. God damn it. It's not right to treat people like that. They don't execute anybody. That's suicide. You're happy to get the hell out of there. Just stop having to think about it day after fucking day. And when you go to the visit room and see your mom crying every time she leaves because she thinks that may be the last time she ever sees you. That's no right to do people like that. It's immoral. It is done deliberately. They want those deaths to be clean and sanitary. No struggles, no fights. And every one of those men that I knew to be strong, to be brave, that I thought would fight didn't, no one did. They were happy they finally came and stuck their hands out the bean hole to be handcuffed willingly. Let's go, let's get this over with. When you get there, they tell you to fill out your last will and testament. And I'd never done it. I was young and brash. Thought I'd live forever. Wasn't mature enough to understand exactly what was happening. What was going to happen to me as well. So I surrendered. I sat down and I filled out my last will and testament. Got it notarized and turned it in. And at first the motivation was to save myself, to clear my name, and then leaned a little more toward making sure the man who was responsible was found and held accountable for his behavior. Revenge against the people that did this to me. And I've only told a few people this because it's embarrassing and I'm never really able to say it right. I've been in about six years, I think. We'd already been moved from the F-Cell house down to H-Unit, this new super maximum facility that they built underground. And I woke up one night in terror. I was shaking and crying and flipping the fuck out. I've had one night terror in my life and that was it. And I saw with great clarity what it was that scared me. That shook me right to my very soul. I had realized in this nightmare that I would never enjoy the influence of women in my life again. It sounds so simple when I say it, but when I woke up that night and I understood so fully what it meant not to be with my mother ever again, my aunts, neighbors, friends, teachers, girlfriends, no one. And realizing the impact that women have on our lives as men, how they motivate and moderate our behavior. And how crucial that is to us as men How much we need that in our lives. I'd never have a girlfriend again. Never hug my mother again. No more sneaking into the kitchen when they were in there baking and making off with a bowl of chocolate. 
I became very good at that when I was a kid. It became a game in our household. Whether or not I could get in there and get that box of chocolate, or the bowl of chocolate. In the ensuing years, when I exercised, and I didn't want to get off that bunk and do it, total depression. Didn't want to eat, didn't want to exercise, didn't want to write letters, nothing. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone. My own psychosis got bad enough. I invented this woman in my head, the archetype. No clear face, just a woman. And that's what motivated me, not to give up every day. Curtis, don't do this to me. Don't come home a wreck. Get off that bed and exercise. Get up. Don't give up. Don't lose your humanity. Come home to me all, person. If you come home to me a wreck, you'll ruin my life too. Be a man. Stay strong. Get up. You might do it. I get up and exercise and move around. I guess the good thing is that the voices in my head were benevolent and encouraged me to do the right thing and not to become an animal like some of my neighbors. Because death row inmates have been declared to be dangerous and uh, untrustworthy. We were locked down all day. We didn't get to go anywhere, do anything, go to the yard. The, on the books, they say that the inmates are locked down 23 hours a day. They were let out of there for an hour every day. And that's not true at all. They would use any weather related excuse to cancel the yard believing, hoping, dreaming that someday I would, I would be discovered and I'd be rescued. I never once in all those years made an attempt to make that cage livable. I always stared at blank walls. I never had correspondence. I didn't want to be comfortable there. And I was told shortly after I got there that being locked down like that will drive you crazy very quickly. Get off the bunk, get up and move, but there's no place to move. All you can do is pace back and forth. Eight steps that way, eight steps back, over and over and over all goddamn day. And to this day, The people that know me, the people that I'm around, the events that I go to, it freaks them out to come out to the hotel to pick me up. Instead of walking around in the world at large, they'll see me on the side of the hotel, eight feet that way, eight feet this way, back and forth, back and forth. Chain smoking. And it looks to people like I'm going crazy when I'm doing it. Just have it. 
That's the way, that's what stopped me from going crazy. I was getting off the bunk and going back and forth, back and forth every day. I didn't care anymore. I had no hope. I stopped dreaming. Why fight? Why suffer anymore? I had two legal pads. One for my mom and one for my dad. And I thought to sit down and write them both long letters. That I would need that much paper. It would take that much space to give to them a proper apology for the way that I had lived my life and the suffering that they were enduring because of my behavior. Days passed, weeks passed, and not one word got written on those legal pads. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where to begin. About three years after I finally got out of prison, Mom died, my dad was going through her stuff. And he found a box of letters. And he thought I really needed to read. And they were all from me to my mom and dad. He wanted me to know why they... had become so frightened. Not of an impending execution or my confinement, but those letters. When you read them, you can see me slowly but surely losing my fucking mind. No longer caring about anything. Never saying anything positive. And locking on to issues that didn't mean anything. visited in those later years they still looked at me with concern and with love but there was something different about it and I never understood it till I read those letters They were thinking that they had lost me and that I was never going to come back. It wasn't a physical thing, it was a mental thing. And there was truth to it. I became a very unpleasant person to be around. Stay the fuck away from me, I mean it. Don't come near me. I don't want to hear it. Fuck off. As I sat there on that bed one day, in this darkest time of my life, I was just blank. I didn't. I was numb, I didn't feel anything, I wasn't thinking anything, I couldn't function anymore. I heard the tap on the window at the door and heard him call mail and kick a letter under my door. And just a plain little envelope. I could tell the writing on it was from my mom. But 
it was real jittery, like she drank way too much coffee or something. Dad told me later, because she was crying the whole time, she was filling it out. Because she was excited. There was no letter in the envelope, it was just a little clipping from the newspaper. It said confidential sources have informed the Oklahoma that the Oklahoma City Police Crime Lab, lab specifically Joyce Gilchrist, was in an investigation by the FBI due to allegations of criminal wrongdoing. I didn't know how far I had gone under, how heavy that load was I carried until I read those words, because I knew with absolute certainty, just felt I knew it in my heart, that they would find out about me. They would rescue me. And they did. It didn't make me angry, it made me sad that I didn't live in the country that I thought I lived in. That we weren't so compassionate after all. That we pursue criminal cases for political purposes. That we don't spend money on the prevention of crime. that instead we wait on these crimes to be committed and exploit them for political gain. And I began to lose faith in my government and I began to lose all respect for them that I'd been taught throughout my life, that I had in my heart to be proud of where I was from and that I belonged to a larger group of people who always did the right thing it felt good to think that that was the true situation. The truth was discovered. I was exonerated and set free. And there was no celebration that day. The last thing that my family and I saw when we left the courtroom that day, after the judge dismissed the indictment against me, was Pam's mom and, and her sister and the rest of her family, supporters, sitting in the back of the courtroom crying by themselves, no one to talk to. There is no cause for celebration when I was released. I was still angry and frustrated. When we got to mom and dad's house that day, word had spread quickly that the judge had finally let me go. And people had begun to assemble at mom and dad's house. Mostly family. And mostly people that had abused mom and dad's hospitality all them years. Dad told me later, he said, I didn't know who the hell that was talking. I don't really remember doing it. He said that we walked in the door and that I didn't hesitate. I walked right in the middle of this group of people who were there to celebrate and said, get the fuck out. That's all. And I came out 44 years old.
my hair going gray. A wreck of a human being, no hope, no future. What do you call him? A man who's basically a nice guy, just irresponsible, who goes to crime, to prison for a crime that he didn't commit, and struggles for years to save his life, and comes out a free man. Nothing I say or the judge or the Innocence Project or anybody else says changes that fact. That designation. That state of mind. Convict. I had to grow up in prison. I grew up with that mentality. I came out with that mentality. Always on point. Don't trust anybody. Celebrate what? Because I was a maximum security inmate all of those years, I was never able to be with my family. We had to visit on the telephone through high-tempered glass and steel bars. My mom and dad are good country folk. They never hurt anybody. They always looked out for their neighbors. They always set a good example. Despite feeling that way that the day that I was released, that there was no cause for celebration, that there was nothing good that happened that day. Nobody won. I didn't. I'm free and I'm grateful of it, but And what I thought was this terrible, sad day. Despite regaining my freedom, was punctuated by this one moment of elation. I never knew what that word meant, of joy. People say that I was so happy, felt so loved that I thought my heart would burst. Think they were just being silly. But I do know what that means now. When my mom put her arms around me to welcome me home, It felt like I just floated up off the ground. Then I finally came up off the bottom. Could breathe again. Every time I think about it, I get goosebumps. Something so simple could feel that good, and how badly I had missed. Simple human contact. And I keep that in mind now when I don't feel good and I'm having a bad day. Simple pleasures. The things we lose sight of when we're busy trying to pay the bills and complaining because we don't have a good internet connection. Stupid shit. Doesn't mean anything. We're alive. What more could you ask for?
What could your friends or family or anybody give you that's more valuable than that? You can't help but have a good life if you grasp that one little detail, that one little fact, your life. Sitting on a park bench, eating an ice cream cone with your girlfriend. Doesn't cost you anything, but it means everything in the world to me. was diagnosed with severe PTSD and declared by the government to be permanently disabled, fully disabled, that I can't function anymore. So I have to rely upon the thing that hurts the most. I have to walk around with my head hanging down all the time, ashamed of myself for my behavior. Doing drugs, staying fucked up all the time. Head in the clouds. I have this little meme from the internet. It says I keep my head in the clouds, but it's not so tragic if I don't look down. I can't find my glasses, I can't find my shoes, where's my cigarettes? I don't know where anything's at, ever. I have no short-term memory, but I know where that little meme is. And as bad as things are for me now, they'd be much worse if I didn't have that influence of the women that I have in my life. The thing that's distressing to me is that I'm unable. I don't have the resources, the mental faculties. To be responsible enough in my own life to be able to face them all like a man and say thank you. I appreciate you more than I'm able to say. And I love you with all my heart. Most of my days are pretty good. I remember to say those words to myself when I wake up every day. Quit whining, you're alive. Go enjoy the day, do something, leave a mark behind, something positive. We're taught in America, in our culture, real men don't cry. Sometimes that's all I do. Every time I see their faces, it breaks my heart. <laughs> I don't know who to talk to. I don't know what to do about it. If I don't have a mama hen around, I don't get anything done. In Oklahoma, the use of methamphetamine and heroin has become a, an epidemic. As I watched the flow of drugs and broken people come by my apartment. I became fascinated by the whole thing. I'd been around this stuff before and I had no interest in it. It just wasn't my thing. But curiosity led to questioning and taking photographs 
of people using drugs because they come to trust me after a while. They saw my record and knew that I wasn't a police officer. And in continuing with their reckless behavior, let me photograph them. And being around it all the time led to using it. If I learned nothing else in prison, it was, it was about wasting time, not to waste time, about how valuable our time is on this planet and to value the people around us, to value the life that we have, to live a rich, full life, a meaningful life, to do something responsible. And I started becoming more and more infatuated with the photographs that I was getting of people using and abusing. I could start to see something of a structure to it. And I can sit for hours going through the images and editing a few here and there, rarely sharing them. And there was something of a, of a milestone in my life each time not of accomplishment, but of, of memory. So in those times of, of bad depression, high anxiety, I've got something I can fall back on, something. I'm proud of the photographs I got in the last two years. I never thought I'd be able to say something like that. I was proud of something that I did. I've got some very cool photographs of some good people doing some terrible things to their bodies, to their minds and their lives, their families. But for every one of those images, I have a positive image of that same person on a good day, sober, smiling and laughing. I believe that they have substance, that they have import, that they tell a story. A story that's not about me this time, it's about somebody else. Ended up homeless, which is okay. I don't mind that I still try to get up every day and be grateful that I'm alive, and that's... I lose sight of it sometimes, but there's a value in that that can't be expressed at all. Simply to be alive. I'm so far ahead of my old friends who didn't survive. I kept telling myself, tomorrow, I'll take care of this tomorrow. I'll call friends and ask for help and getting the rides that I need. And tomorrow never came. Oklahoma has the highest incarceration rate in the country for women, and that is why the gangs recruit young girls, convince them that there's somebody now because they're a member of this powerful group and they have them transport to drugs, and they're the ones that get caught, and they're the ones that go to prison. Nefarious behavior, despicable behavior, cowardly. And that's the least of it. During these times, I've, I've witnessed it, I saw it, I saw all of these women. I kept seeing more and more of them. There's a place in Oklahoma City called Meridian, It's on the west side of the city. It's populated with hotels all the way down toward the airport. And I'd spend a lot of time out there photographing the young women there and talking to them and hearing their stories. Wait, 
I had a new friend in trouble who had suffered far worse than I did. I was able to defend myself. She wasn't. Her community failed her. The courts failed her. Everyone who knew of her plight failed her and allowed this tragedy to continue. She asked me for help and I did it. When I met the young woman I spoke of earlier, I was at that crossroads in my life. Do or die, sink or swim. And I was okay with sinking. I had no problem with it. I've never been particularly fatalistic or suicidal, but that's sort of the path that I was on. I'm not particularly courageous. And the truth is that she pulled me back from that terrible life. As much as I tried to pull her back, it was a mutual effort. It's been a hell of a ride so far, I hope that it's not over yet. And to know what it means to live without coercion and violence, without the daily need for heroin or anything else in her life that impedes her progress. Towards self-realization. Becoming the woman and the mother that she wants to be. You're a good kid, Charlie Brown. I'm sorry, I was a pain in the ass. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. I wrote this, um, one day when we were sitting alongside of this empty building and, um, I'm sitting here in the sunshine. I'm sitting here in the sunshine on a cracked, beaten down, overstepped on, worn down sidewalk. Scenery is awful, and ugly, and dark. Though the most beautiful of all things I've ever seen, right before me, a tree. But this year, a tree is not just any tree, it is a tree of dignity and grace. And its seed was planted, and its seed was not planted in a beautiful green field with other trees whose land, atmosphere, and resources allowed them to 
very strong and tall. This particular tree planted its seed in the tiniest cracks that ran between the cement of the most ugliest, most bitter scenery known to mankind and grew strong and tall, just as though those in the green fields did. Its growth started out stunned, started out slow because its small, fragile roots were not yet strong enough to let the cement grow. However, with time, it figured out that though it might not be strong enough to grow, um, to grow through it, but it could grow and thrive under it. And so here I sit on a beautiful day in sunshine with horrible scenery and yet the most beautiful thing ever. <laughs> The roots of the most stunning, most graceful, and most beautiful tree that not only grew underneath the cement floor, 